Okay, this is the mic for the live stream. Hearing that? Hello? Mic. Is this working? A little bit of a delay. A little bit of static on this on this microphone now. Hmm. Okay. Like it's too loud, basically. Oh, uh, okay. C great, because these are the these are the remote mics that we're gonna use for people if they're if they have Q and A. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Well, then I think our testing is complete. So go and if there's any concerns, just text me. Okay.
Yes, I live in Mars. You want more? From where did you know? High school? Class of 76, and it bangs. 73, so we would have crossed paths. You would have been graduating, and uh, I would have been in Greece. You know what that was. Freshman. Yeah, I know. It's a small room, you can't miss it. Yeah, okay, I, yeah, I know what you said too. When did your friends come on?
Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, if everyone will take their seats, please. Excuse me, everyone. We're going to get started. If um, you all take your seats, please. Thank you. Can everyone hear me OK? Can everyone in the back hear me? OK, great. Um, so, good afternoon. Thank you everyone so much for attending this meeting. Um, this is a public information meeting from the Connecticut Department of Transportation for the Eastern Connecticut Corridor Rail and Transit Feasibility Study. I'm Elise Greenberg. I'm a transportation planner at the Connecticut DOT in the Office of Policy and Planning. I'm also the DOT's project manager for this study. I am joined by Jill Cahoon who is the project manager at our consultant team at AECOM. Um, and we also have others from AECOM as well as our um, consultant team at WSP who helped organize this event. So thank you as well. Um, and so uh, thank you for being here um, and attending this public information meeting. Um, we also refer to this, uh, since it is a long name, the name of the study, as the ECRTS study. So you'll hear that acronym throughout the night. Um, the purpose of this meeting is to present the ECRTS findings um, and receive comments and questions on those findings specifically. Uh, the study team here today is aware that there have been recent announcements of temporary service impacts. Uh, due to construction and also near-term reductions to regular shoreline east service. Um, please be aware that today's meeting is focused solely on the findings of the ECRTS study. Uh, there will be public hearings conducted in the first week of October regarding the recent communications about shoreline east. Uh, so anyone with questions or comments regarding those announcements or current service changes is encouraged to reach out to the email DOT that proposed transit changes at ct.gov. Um, and with that, um, thank you again. And we look forward to presenting the ECRTS findings. So we'll start off by reading uh, the Title VI statement. Uh, no person shall, on the basis of race, color, or national origin, be excluded from participation are subject to discrimination in the development of this project. And you can find out more about your Title VI rights by visiting https colon forward slash forward slash portal dot ct dot gov forward slash dot forward slash business forward slash office dash of dash equity 
forward slash title, forward slash V, I, forward, forward slash dash. dash, sorry, yes, you're correct, dash page. <laughs> um, and uh, we also encourage you following this meeting to take a voluntary post-meeting survey. Um, that will allow us to uh, continue to improve upon our public information meeting processes. And you can, um, uh, you can complete that survey by visiting https dash forward slash forward slash portal. Thank you. <laughs> HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash portal dot ct dot gov forward slash ct dot survey. And there is also um, a QR code that you are also welcome to scan that will bring you right to that survey. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. Um, and it is also being live streamed and a recording of this presentation and meeting will be posted to YouTube after this event. Uh, at that time, closed captioning, including non-English translation options will be available on YouTube. And so more on Title VI, the Connecticut Department of Transportation operates its programs and services without regard to race, color, and national origin in accordance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Any person who believes she or he has been aggrieved by any unlawful discriminatory practice under Title VI may file a complaint with the Connecticut DOT. For more information on the Connecticut DOT's civil rights program and the procedures to file a complaint, contact the Connecticut DOT Title VI coordinator at 860-594-2169 or you can visit www.ct.gov forward slash DOT. And here is a Spanish translation of those statements. So in moving on to the presentation, um, we'll begin today's presentation with an overview of the study as well as some background information. Um, and then I'll be providing uh, an overview of existing conditions in the public transportation market. I'll then turn it over to Jill, who will go through the preliminary feasibility assessment and then provide more detailed um, uh, information on corridor and station refinements, as well as service strategies, cost, revenue, and ridership projections, greenhouse gas reduction estimates, and uh, some of the economic benefits that we um, assessed. And then I will wrap up with the feasibility study conclusion, and we'll then move into a question and answer session. So this study was initiated by the Connecticut Department of Transportation in early 2022 at the direction of the Connecticut legislature um, with the direction to investigate the feasibility and market for extending the Shoreline East Rail Service to the state of Rhode Island establishing a new passenger rail service from the city of New London and to the city of Norwich, establishing a new passenger train station in the town of Groton in Stonington mm -hmm. Borough, as well as extending other ground transportation systems in the eastern region of the state and providing interconnectivity between such, such systems and rail lines. Uh, so it is important to note that this is a feasibility study, um, which is a very preliminary first step and it's intended to be a data-driven, comprehensive um, evaluation of the viability of potential service. And depending on the findings, further uh, increasingly detailed studies and designs may follow. So as I mentioned, this study has been intended to be very comprehensive um, in looking at the viability of potential service as well as transit service enhancements. Uh, there have been a lot of different public and stakeholder engagement activities throughout the course of the study, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, and that has helped supplement the existing conditions that we looked at in the corridor, um, the data, uh, in terms of demographics, employment, major trip generators, and travel patterns. Um, and then all of those existing conditions and engagement fed into uh, the preliminary feasibility assessment where we took a, a closer look at the infrastructure. Uh, we also looked at the corridor capacity for service. Um, we identified a variety of potential station locations. And then throughout that preliminary feasibility assessment, there were some uh, constraints that we identified, um, which led to us refining the specific corridors 
that would be most viable for service, um, as well as potential station locations. And all of that was then leading into a uh, much deeper dive at looking at uh, potential service operations, um, equipment needs. Uh, then we also looked on the bus side at uh, transit enhancements um, in the long term and the short term. Um, we looked at ridership forecasts for both bus and transit. Uh, we looked at capital and operation costs. And we looked at environmental and economic benefits. And all of that uh, is described and rolled up into the draft final report. Uh, so looking at the existing rail service uh, in the study area, the, uh, the portion along the northeast corridor in the study area is currently uh, owned by Amtrak, which operates uh, the Acela Express service, as well as Northeast uh, Regional Service, and they currently operate at stations in New London, Mystic, and Westerly, Rhode Island. Um, we also have Connecticut Rail, CT Rail's Shoreline East service, which operates from New Haven to L New London, um, and there are connections to CT Rail's Hartford Line in New Haven, as well as Metro North's New Haven Line in New Haven. Um, and then looking up uh, north to the along the Thames River corridor, um, we have uh, that corridor is owned by Genesee and Wyoming Incorporated. Um, they are also they operate freight and um, they operate the Palmer Line on the west side of the Thames River and the Norwich Line on the east side of the Thames River, and uh, they currently operate freight on an unscheduled uh, route, but uh, they typically operate one to two trains daily to meet current market demand. We also looked at the existing transit service in the study area. Currently, there are seven transit pr providers that operate in the area. Uh, there's 21 fixed bus routes, three on-demand services, two inner-city bus routes, and four ferry routes. There's also uh, options for bicycle and pedestrian um, transportation. The fixed route bus service in the study area is largely operated by Southeast Transit District, or SEAT. Um, however, there's also a route that's operated by Wyndham Area Transit District, as well as Nine Town Transit District. And serving westerly on the Rhode Island side, there is a fixed route, as well as a flex zone operated by Rhode Island Public Transportation Authority, or RIPTA. So in looking at the study area characteristics, we looked at uh, population and sociodemographic uh, data. And um, the study area is comprised of a variety of different municipalities, ranging from urban to suburban to rural communities. Uh, we used the federal government's Justice 40 mapping tool, uh, which is used for their Justice 40 program, uh, to identify census tracts that are uh, considered disadvantaged by the federal government, and those are census tracts that meet a, a certain threshold requirements and a variety of factors, such as climate change, health, access to transportation, uh, legacy pollution, and, and others. Um, so you can see that um, there are uh, justice tracts in Groton, New London, Norwich, as well as Westerly. Um, Groton, Norwich, and New London also uh, are the most, um, the densest populated communities in the study area uh, in comparison to their neighbors. Um, and we also looked at the uh, Connecticut Department of Economic and uh, Community Development also uh, designates what they call distressed municipalities, the top 25 in the state. And um, according to the ECD's 2022 list, there were um, Nor Norwich, Montville, New London, and Groton um, were on their list in 2022. Uh, so what this all means is that uh, there are communities, specifically in the study area, that potentially could uh, greatly benefit by having better access to transportation options as well as growth opportunities. We also wanted to look at the uh, existing travel patterns in the study area. Um, so where people are moving, where they're coming from, where they're going to, especially for work. Uh, so in looking at commuting patterns, 
And um, you'll see on the top map, uh, that shows uh, where those who live in the study area are traveling to work. So you can see that study area residents uh, largely live within the study, or largely work within the study area, um, but there are also uh, study area residents that are traveling up to areas like Hartford um, and Providence. And in the bottom map, we are looking at where those who work in the study area live. Um, so in this map, you can see that study area employees, also many of them live within the study area, but also in the areas immediately surrounding the study area. I apologize. <laughs> the, the, this appears to be on a timer. Um, also, in the areas immediately surrounding the study area, up toward northeast uh, Connecticut, up toward Providence, and out toward Hartford. And not only do we want to look at where people are moving around um, in the region, we also wanted to look at traffic volumes. Um, so we looked at data from a third-party vendor called Streetlight, which uh, collects data from cell phones. Um, and what the streetlight data um, has shown us, we looked at different def destinations uh, in the study area, such as Foxwoods, the Groton Submarine Base, Mohegan Sun, Mystic, New London Center, Norwich Center, Pfizer and Electric Boat, Stonington, and then Westerly. Um, and you will see in the chart, uh, weekday average daily traffic is shown in red, and weekend uh, average daily traffic is shown in green. And then all days, daily traffic is shown in blue. Um, so not surprising, you can see that destinations like Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun have a lot of weekend average daily traffic. And uh, destinations like the Groton Submarine Base, as well as Pfizer and Electric Boat, have a lot of average weekday traffic. So as I had mentioned previously, the we intended to have um, a lot of stakeholder as well as public engagement throughout the study process to help supplement the data that we were uh, assessing and analyzing. Um, so in addition to having a study steering committee, we also met throughout the study with various working groups, um, with the transit operators, rail operators, um, we met with um, municipal chief elected officials as well as municipal staff. And um, we met with what we call a customer focus group, uh, specifically organizations that have a diverse understanding of the broad needs of the communities in the area. Um, on top of that, we also conducted about 20 different interviews with major employers and anchor institutions in the region to understand uh, the needs of their employees, their future plans, and how transportation could, could better serve them as well. Um, and last December, which many of you may have attended, we had three public meetings, and we also conducted a, a public survey throughout the month of December and early January. So I will now turn it over to Jill, who will go over the feasibility assessment. So we're still on the timer. Thank you everyone uh, for joining us here this afternoon. It's great to see all of you. I'm Jill Cahoon with, with AECOM. Um, our, our slides appear to be on a timer again, so uh, sorry we might switch back and forth a little bit. Um, so I'll uh, walk through the preliminary feasibility assessment and then the additional more detailed uh, elements of analysis that we went through uh, after going through that preliminary feasibility assessment. So for the preliminary feasibility assessment, we looked at, as Elise mentioned, uh, three corridors um, of, for rail as well as ground transportation solutions. So for the preliminary feasibility assessment on the rail side, we looked at the Thames River corridor, which included looking at the alignments along the west side of the Thames River or the Palmer Line and on the east side of the Thames River or the Norwich Branch. Uh, we also looked at the Groton Secondary and we also looked along the Northeast Corridor uh, from New London to Westerly. And then within each of these, uh, these, these alignments along these corridors, we looked at different station area zones. So we divided the corridors into seven different station area zones. That was the west side of the Thames River, the east side mm -hmm. of the Thames River, the Groton Secondary, 
and then station area zones in Groton, Mystic, and Stonington. Within each of these station area zones, we looked at two or three possible station locations. And when we looked at each of these station locations, uh, we were looking to be able to identify the, the optimal location within each of these segments. So we looked at things like site constraints, operational feas feasibility, existing land uses, future development, environmental considerations, transit supportive land use, and then, of course, market development potential. Uh, we did look at a transit-oriented development potential at the corridor level during the preliminary feasibility assessment and then at the station level in more detailed analysis. Uh, as we worked through the preliminary feasibility assessment, uh, we did identify some primary constraints that ended up having a great impact on the options that we, were, um, that we looked at in more detail for the further analysis. One of the major constraints in the region is the Thames River Movable Bridge, shown in the picture uh, in the middle of this slide here. Um, in the open position, marine traffic is able to flow through. In the closed position, that's when trains are able to pass. The U.S. Coast Guard determines how long in every hour the bridge is allowed to be closed for train traffic. And of course, they have a preference for keeping it open longer for marine traffic. Uh, so right now, the U.S. Coast Guard and Amtrak have an agreement for the number of times uh, per hour that the, tr that the bridge can be closed for uh, the trains to pass. When looking at both the existing service that goes across the Thames River Bridge uh, operated by Amtrak, as well as Amtrak's proposed uh, expansions, uh, we conducted a corridor capacity analysis and identified that one train per hour in each direction could go across the Thames River Movable Bridge and fit within existing and um, expanded uh, potential schedules uh, from Amtrak. So this means that for any trains going east of New London, uh, the possibility right now would be a one train per hour in each direction. Uh, so that helped to inform uh, the analysis moving forward in the preliminary feasibility assessment. So at that point, we had the, the option of, of looking at uh, one train going across the, the bridge uh, per hour in each direction. Uh, some other constraints and considerations uh, that went into the analysis included the construction of uh, potentially new stations, uh, new station locations, and also um, the Shoreline East service operates using M8s, and those are uh, electric train sets, and they um, have, um, they require high-level boarding uh, in order to operate through, uh, through stations. Additionally, uh, in order to provide new train service, um, Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, um, uh, compliance needs to be met as well, so high-level boarding platforms are also required uh, in order to operate uh, ADA compliance service. And right now, the, the station location at, at Mystic is located uh, at, a, at a very steep curve, and high-level platforms would not be possible there, so we did look at uh, alternative locations for the Mystic Station. Uh, additionally, Westerly, Rhode Island right now um, also has does not have um, high-level platforms. The Amtrak service doesn't need the high-level platforms. Uh, so we did look at both the construction of new stations as well as accommodating the high-level uh, platforms. Uh, and then, of course, um, in order to um, operate uh, rail service into this new territory, the trains would then need a place to be stored, and they would also need a place to turn around and a place to move out of the way for other Amtrak services to come through. So we did have to look for yard and storage space as well as turning track uh, in order to consider the feasibility of operating um, commuter rail service in this region. So based on the preliminary feasibility assessment, as well as the market assessment that was included as part of that, identifying that we could only have one train per hour in each direction cross the Thames River Bridge, uh, we are looking at uh, the alignment within the Northeast Corridor from New London to Westerly, and an alignment along the west side of the Thames River so that the, move, the, uh, the trains would only cross one train per hour um, in, uh, across the, the bridge east of New London. Then within these corridors, looking at these alignments, and again, they're aligned with the, with the market demand as well, 
um, and making sure that we had an alignment in each of the corridors. Um, we also looked at station locations. Um, as I mentioned, we looked in station area zones, and then we screened those station areas based on um, the analysis and identified sta seven, seven station <laughs> locations uh, to look at uh, along these two corridors. So along the Northeast Corridor, from New London to Westerly, that was a Groton Station. Um, also, uh, we called it sometimes Groton West. We looked at, at a Mystic Alternative a location uh, east of the current location, a location in Stonington Borough, uh, as well as the existing uh, stations in Westerly, uh, station in Westerly. And then moving north along the Thames River Corridor out of New London, uh, we looked at station areas at uh, the U.S. Coast Guard Academy and Connecticut College, in Montville near Mohegan Sun, and then at the Norwich, Norwich Transportation Center uh, on the west side of, of Norwich. Uh, so these were the corridors and the stations that we moved forward for additional analysis. From the analysis, we identified both shorter and longer term strategies. The shorter term strategies were, are to expand and enhance the transit, or bus transit, or ground transportation, uh, solutions in uh, throughout this region. So these include things like uh, making fixed route transit service more direct, more frequent, for longer hours of service and for more days of week of the week uh, to be served by transit. Transit priority uh, solutions uh, in order to make transit faster in the major uh, corridor connections uh, between New London and Norwich and Groton and Norwich along Route 32 and Route 12. Additional, um, uh, both fixed route and demand response service solutions in Mystic, as well as other locations uh, in Groton. Uh, and we'll go into these in, in much greater detail, but those are the uh, shorter term strategies uh, coming out of the preliminary feasibility assessment. On the longer term side, we did look at the possibility of um, expanding uh, commuter rail service again along the Northeast Corridor from New London to Westerly and along the Thames River Corridor on the west side or the Palmer Line. And we looked at those seven station locations that I just described. And again, we'll go into more detail on this as well. But these were the alignments in the station areas um, and the strategies that we, that we moved forward for additional analysis coming out of the preliminary feasibility assessment. So we'll get into the details. So first, starting with the short-term strategies or the transit service strategies, note that these, these transit strategies could be also the long-term strategy. The transit strategies could be the strategies that, are, uh, that meet the needs of the region and are, are the solution. Uh, so it, it's considered in both the, the short-term and the long-term condition. So for fixed route services, um, we looked at streamlining some of the services, making the service more direct. Uh, and also increasing the frequency of service. Uh, right now, the, the, seat, um, the seat services, the Southeast Area Transit District services, are flags operated by a flag stop system. So that means that folks can flag down the bus almost, almost anywhere. And uh, that can actually slow, slow down the operation of the bus and not make uh, the, the service very direct or very quick. Uh, so having fixed stops with amenities for people to wait could speed up the bus as well. Uh, so we looked at those uh, types of policy changes as well as fixed route uh, solutions. We also looked at things like transit signal priority so that buses would have preference over general traffic um, as well as other queue jump lanes or other roadway configurations to provide uh, preference for, for transit uh, to be able to operate again more directly and, and more quickly, particularly along route, routes 32 and route 12 but also in other areas across the, across the study area. Then in conjunction with those fixed route strategies, we also identified demand response strategies. Uh, and those are dial-a-ride or microtransit strategies. Right now, there are two microtransit zones operating in the study area uh, in Stonington and in New London. Um, and there's also a flex zone in Westerly that's operated by RIPTA. Uh, these services complement a fixed route transit network, and uh, we looked at uh, increasing the, the hours of service along the, for these microtransit existing services, adding additional days of service uh, 
for the week, as well as adding an additional, uh, an additional zone in Groton uh, for those first mile, last mile connections. So looking at these two uh, sets of strategies, the fixed route and the demand response strategies as a package, that's a, it's a substantial increase in the amount of service provided uh, in the region for, for bus transit. It actually is an increase of nearly 53% of the annual service uh, hour, so it's, it's quite substantial. And when we looked at the uh, bus service strategies, as I mentioned, they can be a standalone solution. Uh, we also looked at what the modification to the bus system could look like if rail service in either or both of the rail corridors were to be implemented later on. Uh, so we looked at what that uh, would look like in that. So that would be a slight uh, a change uh, or, or a reduction in, in bus service because of the duplication uh, if, if the rail service were to be uh, implemented. So for the bus standalone um, uh, scenario, we're looking at a, th a 25% increase in ridership, um, as well as looking at a substantial vehicle miles traveled uh, reduction and greenhouse gas reduction uh, over time. Please note that these greenhouse gas reductions are only estimated shown here for service changes. As the, uh, the fleet uh, at, at SEAT is electrified, and SEAT also did receive a grant to electrify their bus garage, uh, so as those um, uh, electrification and decarbonization efforts are also put into place. Uh, the, the numbers of greenhouse gas reductions associated with transit solutions uh, grows very, very quickly, very, very dramatically. Uh, so there's a huge uh, potential for reducing greenhouse gas emissions with, with transit ser service, fleet, and garage um, upgrades. Also uh, note that we used a horizon year of 2028 for our modeling for the bus transit strategies, and we used a horizon modeling year of 2035 for our rail transit strategies. We estimated the annual operating costs, how much uh, additional um, funds would need to be available every year in order to operate the expanded transit service uh, strategies. And again, we're looking at all of these as a, as a package. So for the fixed route strategies, that's an additional $2.5 million per year that would be needed to operate those services. That's an increase in costs of 35%. And looking at the demand response cost estimates, as I mentioned, that's a, a whole nother zone as well as additional uh, hours of service and days. Uh, that's actually an, an additional $1.5 million per year uh, to operate those demand response services, and that's an increase in, in budget of 115%. Additionally, in order to do some of these things, there's some infrastructure and capital or one-time costs associated uh, with, with these uh, improvement strategies. This includes the uh, converting to a fixed stop system, transit signal priority, bus stop infrastructure, uh, as well as additional vehicles in order to uh, operate the uh, expanded service. And that uh, capital cost total is between nine and $10 million. Now, switching gears to the rail service side of the longer term strategies, as I mentioned, we did look along the, the Palmer Line or the west side of the Thames River, as well as along the northeast corridor from New London to Westerly. For each of these corridors, we looked at through service, which would be extending the current shoreline east service that comes here from New Haven, extending that uh, to the different the two different terminals, so extending that all the way to Westerly or extending that all the way to Norwich. And so we looked at that in each corridor. We also in each corridor looked at shuttle service, which would be just service between New London and Westerly or just service between New London and Norwich. And that would, of course, um, require a transfer to, um, to um, the, the shoreline east service. Additionally, uh, we also looked at in the, um, in the Thames River corridor along the Palmer Line, we also looked at a hybrid service scenario, and that would be some, uh, most of the trains would be operated as a shuttle service between New London and Norwich, but a few trains per day would come straight through New Haven and go from New Haven, New London, straight to Norwich. So we looked at that hybrid option as well. Um, so in looking at each of these different strategies and analyzing um, the, the different options based on those service strategies, uh, we looked in more detail at the Shoreline East extension 
from uh, New Haven, New London to Westerly along the main line and shuttle service, um, actually it's a hybrid, uh, the shuttle service between um, uh, New London and Norwich with the few trains a day that are uh, through trains from, from Shoreline East. Uh, so we'll get into the details about that now. So looking at the uh, Northeast Corridor, um, we're looking at the Shoreline East Extension, again, from New Haven through New London all the way to Westerly. That would be 12 round trips per day. That travel time's about 22 to 24 minutes uh, one way. Uh, would require a new operating plan uh, to fit in with the Shoreline East service operated um, between New London and New Haven now. Uh, it also assumes that one morning and one afternoon um, it, uh, through train from Stamford would be restored, so we, we include that in the, in the projection. And that looks like, uh, with the projections of ridership, looks like an additional 159,000 riders per year. Uh, moving on to the Palmer line, again, we focused on the hybrid um, solution, which is both shuttle and through service. It's eight northbound and 10 southbound trips per day. Uh, it's about a 27 minute trip one way. And 15 of the trips would be the shuttle trips between New London and Norwich, and three trips would be those uh, through trips from New Haven to New London to Norwich. Um, that does uh, result in an estimated or projected um, additional 126,000 riders per year. So similarly, um, there's a lot of uh, capital and infrastructure costs, and we also uh, projected operating costs for the rail service as well. So for the rail service along the Northeast Corridor, we're looking at three new stations. We need the new high-level platforms. We need the storage space. We need the, the track to turn the trains around. We need the track to allow other trains to pass. Um, and we need additional train sets uh, in order to operate that service. So for the Northeast Corridor Shoreline East Extension, that's uh, an estimated uh, $243 million, and those are in 2023 dollars. For the Palmer Line, uh, the hybrid service scenario, um, we are looking at three uh, new stations, uh, as well as a substantial track uh, upgrade, um, substantial technology, grade crossings, uh, storage space, and additional train sets in order to operate that service. So that's $636 million in capital cost for the Palmer line. We also estimated operating costs in order to operate the, um, the service along either of the corridors. So for alternative one, which is that uh, Northeast Corridor extension to Westerly, um, that's about $218,000 a day to operate that service or $52.3 million per year. Um, and then the service between uh, New London and Norwich, again, that hybrid shuttle but with some through trains, that's about $137,000 a day for a total of $33 million a year. Um, and again, um, as we discussed a few slides ago, that you know, also uh, is, is associated with the ridership projections of 286,000 uh, new riders uh, in, in the, both of the corridors in the two corridors, as well as um, uh, greenhouse gas uh, reductions that are pretty substantial. So in order to maximize the, the benefit of uh, rail and transit investment, um, there are some things that can be put in place to realize economic benefit. Uh, in the shorter term, in order to construct the infrastructure needed for these strategies, there are short-term benefits from the creation of construction jobs. Um, there's also, uh, in this region, um, a lack of affordable housing options, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but these uh, investment in rail and transit strategies, um, uh, along with uh, developing affordable housing options and potential for transit-oriented development and access uh, to higher-paying jobs, are all ways to, you know, to maximize this investment. And as always, pairing transit and rail investment with land use uh, policies that promote density, walkability, and multimodal connectivity uh, are where you get the most bang for your buck. So uh, as I mentioned, we conducted a transit-oriented development corridor scan as part of the original uh, uh, preliminary feasibility assessment. And then more recently, in the detailed analysis, uh, we looked at the station level. Um, so historically, 
Um, looking backward, um, compared to other benchmark cities along the Northeast Corridor, uh, this, this region has had um, a lower median income, less job growth, uh, and also a smaller share of professional jobs. Um, so transportation access is, is really key um, to, to turning those things around. Um, there's also a housing affordability uh, challenge. 44% uh, of all renters are cost burdened. That means that they spend more than 30% of their income on, um, on housing, uh, which is a really substantial percentage. Uh, so we did look at um, the housing availability and housing affordability as part of our transit-oriented development. Um, uh, look at the seven station areas uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, on the map, on, the, on the, the two maps on the bottom of the slide, I know they're a bit hard to see, um, but generally speaking, we looked at both the availability of multifamily housing in each station area, and there's a bunch of uh, dots where those are located. And then we looked at how many of those were, were affordable uh, housing options. And you can see that, at least from, from a distance, you can see there are a lot, lot fewer dots. Uh, so there are a lack of, of affordable housing uh, options within the station areas. So the Thames River Corridor in particular is a good candidate for transit-oriented development um, with the associated zoning changes to enable that to happen. Uh, there are nearly 1,000 vacant parcels uh, within the Thames River Corridor and a demographic propensity for transit ridership uh, that Elise presented in those Justice 40 slides up front. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Jill, for reviewing in detail uh, all of the rail as well as uh, transit strategies that we've identified through this study. Uh, so in conclusion, as Joe mentioned, uh, there are a number of transit strategies that could be implemented that would satisfy short-term as well as long-term uh, transportation needs within the region, in particular along the Thames River Corridor. Um, and in the longer term future, there are rail strategies that may be viable also, um, and in particular along the Northeast Corridor where there is a more of a, a market for, for rail uh, transportation. Uh, and so as I mentioned in the beginning, this is a feasibility study. It's a preliminary first step. Um, so there are more steps that would be needed to take this to fruition. Um, additional designs and studies would be needed uh, to implement any transit or rail strategies. Um, and at the moment, any next steps are currently not funded. Um, but if things, um, you know, we do identify funding and um, there is a decision to move things forward, uh, the, the future steps would need to move through the project life cycle timeline. So the FTA, or Federal Transit Administration, identifies four large phases of the project life cycle timeline. Um, the first is project or systems planning. Uh, the next phase is project development, and then the, after that, there's engineering, and then there's construction. And after a project is constructed, there's also then an additional step of ongoing uh, operations as well as maintenance of the service, the infrastructure, and the equipment. Uh, so as presented in the study and as Jill went through the strategies, um, there's, there's sort of a bucket of rail strategies that could move forward as well as um, a bucket of transit strategies. Um, however, if there was one strategy within those options or, or a combination of smaller strategies um, that were identified upon further study as viable independently, uh, those strategies could move forward independently and be incrementally phased in. Um, they, they would still need to move through the project life cycle process that was described in the prior slide. Um, and so as an example of a service, a rail service that was recently uh, introduced in Connecticut, in, uh, there is the Hartford Line Rail Program, which is formerly known as the NHHS program or New Haven to Hartford Springfield program. Uh, that is a very large rail program that is being implemented using a phased approach. Um, and so to illustrate as an example the timeline, the Hartford Line 
did start with a feasibility study in 1994 and moved through the project life cycle process with environmental assessment, not until 2012, and then went through design and construction. And the initial phases of services began in 2018. And this is still an ongoing program with ongoing um, stations being constructed and additional service uh, to be implemented in the future. Uh, it is also a uh, great example of a project that involved um, multi-jurisdictions. Uh, we had a partner with Amtrak, as well as Massachusetts, as well as the federal government, and there are many different uh, sources of funding that went into this to make this happen. So what's next for the ECRTS specifically? Uh, well, currently we're wrapping up um, this final round of uh, public meetings. Uh, there is another meeting tonight. It's a virtual meeting at 6 o'clock. Um, and we are currently within the public comment period through October 20th. Um, we are receiving comments on the draft final report. Um, and then after that public comment period ends on October 20, 20th, we'll be uh, reviewing all of the feedback that we receive and looking to incorporate it to finalize the re final report and deliver it to the legislature by November 30th. Uh, the final draft report is available on the ECRTS study website. Um, it is intended to be a summary document. As you know, we have described, there is a lot of data, there is a lot of analysis that has gone into this study. Um, and that is all reflected within 13 technical appendices, Appendix A through M. And all of those are also available in the document library of the study website. Um, so we encourage you to review the draft final report. Uh, and if there's something specific that you would like to see more in-depth information, um, we encourage you to look at those respective appendices as well. Um, and any Questions or public comments can be submitted through October 20th uh, to, by email to dotplanning at ct.gov, or you can leave a voicemail at 860-594-2020. Uh, more information is also available on the study website. Um, and so with that, uh, we will move into the Q&A period. I'm going to invite others that are here from the Connecticut DOT from the Office of Rail and Office of Transit and Ride Sharing, um, who will also help to answer your questions. Um, what would be most helpful to today is to hear questions or comments specifically on the findings that were um, that you heard that are in within the final report. Um, and uh, we do ask, since there is a good uh, group of people here, that. Uh, you be mindful of um, the length of your questions and comments and try to keep it, if possible, close to roughly three minutes or so. That way, everyone has a chance to, to ask their questions and everyone has a chance to voice their comments. Um, if, if there's more beyond that you would like to discuss, the study team will be here after the meeting. Um, and we are also happy to take your information and uh, correspond with you as a follow-up as well. Um, we also have uh, Zell Stever here today, who is a member of the study steering committee, and I believe he has some words he would like to say uh, once everyone has asked their questions or made their comments as well. Um, so with that, I will let the study team introduce themselves. Um, and I believe Laura will help also direct um, individuals as we get to um, question by question. So, uh, good afternoon. My name is David Elder. I'm one of the uh, managers of the Bureau of Policy and Planning. I would say if there's any elected officials here who would like to start, maybe have a question and answer or something to say, I'd like to uh, give them an opportunity to say that. If there are any, go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, and I'm sorry, we'll do introductions first and then I will come right to you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Elise Greenberg again from the Office of Policy and Planning. Good afternoon, Rich Jankovich. I'm the rail administrator for Connecticut Department of Transportation. Manager in the Office of Transit and Ride Sharing in the Contract Management Unit, which oversees the bus services. And I'm Kyle Craig. I'm a planner for the Office of Rail for Connecticut DOT. 
Are we using microphones, or is it just, just the room? Um, we do have them if, if you need it. For the, that's for the live stream, because of the other room. OK, uh, if we could hand that to the gentleman, please raise yeah. your hand. Thank you. My name is Michael Sheffers. I'm the warden of the borough of Stonington, Connecticut. I've been working with Danielle on this. She is the first selectman of the town. Station has proposed, not knowing the exact location, it could be either in the borough or in the town, depending on the other site. Um, so we are in. Um, I guess personally, as well as getting back from the other Burgesses, um, we are certainly supportive of having a stone in the village. Um, I think it's for purposes of economic development and the, kind of the governor's goals of trying to expand um, affordable housing, this corridor, the economic development associated. to say, I think the proposed mystic location is um, to site it potentially on wetlands is not a particularly good idea. I would recommend that it be moved to the west side of the existing rail um, In Stonington, again, not know where the exact site in this, it would be either, either the borough or the town. So. Um, and I think in general, just public response to this study. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Who has a question? I have one. Yes, sir. Uh, so don't worry, only class time, not gonna ask 50 questions. Uh, hello, my name is Finn Sullivan. I'm a local nearby here. Not any sort of official position, but uh, it's mainly about uh, three things. One, uh, in the original preliminary uh, feasibility report, you mentioned a 80 mile per hour proposed speed on the Thames Corridor, or which as the final report, draft, well, draft final report, Stated is not feasible due to the track geometry. I'm curious about how you uh, got the original 80 per mile per hour, uh, I think 12, 16 minute uh, time that was originally used in the original Northwest Corridor uh, preliminary study. And track class. Based on track classification. Yeah. Based on track tra ah. classification. And then secondly, speaking of track geometry, uh, if you, this is a bit, uh, might be a bit out there, but based on the uh, track geometry, if you notice many of the curves that are along the Thames, on the Palmer line of the Thames Corridor are basically these curves where the, where the Bent River bends inward into the land and then bends back outward, which creates lots of these windy curves that of course make it hard to run higher speed services and make the track geometry worse for said higher speed services. Hypothetically, if you built the proper culverts and uh, bridges over, you could potentially build some sort of causeways or uh, uh, like very cheap bridges because you don't many of these cases you don't need to build local bridges to go over these areas. So having low, uh, having short, low causeways, with proper of course proper culverts or or areas for water to go into without causing the ecological damage of uh, habitat separation that co that causes commonly cause could be beneficial to massively decreasing travel times and speed, making this a more viable service. This because the truth is that that it should be in theory a rail service should be in theory on par with or better at speed than highway travel. Your comment. That's just a comment. Okay, no, it's what we need to know. That's yeah. what we're just yeah. trying to react to questions. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. And then finally, uh, I'll just pass. 
someone else in the last layer. There's one more thing, that's it. Thank you for your comment. Anyone else have a question or a comment? Yes, sir. Seed is very interested, obviously, in partnering with the state on enhancing uh, the bus. Said before, uh, so environmentally, they would be kind of a neutral. Uh, well, definitely less environmental impact stations wouldn't be as uh, distant would be much more. So my question is, realistically, would you to implement the short-term uh, bus component? Obviously, that at that. Right now, I don't know what kind of time span on that. I, I, I assume it would have to be when the funding is, funding is, unless you break that off into a separate uh, funding uh, pile of money and go as uh, combined so you can. Uh, enhance that and move it along faster. Is, uh, so is there some planning on that? I know that you could, that you could do that or give, uh, give me so I can take back some indications of what, what the time sequence might be on the busing uh, strategy. So uh, Lisa Rivers, who was here last night, she's one of our managers, and they said that uh, roughly electric buses are, are on a three-year back order right now. So even if we were to initiate the order today, that we'd be looking at three years. Last night, that uh, new electric buses are on a three-year three -year out order right now. Yeah. Does that mean that uh you're going to make a more solid recommendation uh, if, if the order So the sooner you make a decision on that, the, uh, the sooner, since there's such a thing on that. Right. The major, the major component, obviously, is procuring uh, electric buses. If that's your um, final solution, I guess you could do gasoline powered before that, if you uh, so desire. At that point, you have more impact on uh, carbon emissions and, and whatnot. So I'm going to, um, so I'm going to simplify sort of the question. So. So we're going to prepare a, uh, a report that was asked to be prepared by the legislature. And assuming these recommendations are they move forward, or even if we were to make service adjustments, you know, from day one, how long does it take to do that service um, change? Whatever day someone says go, how long would it take you to make the change? So if you separated out the equipment question and you just went simply the service and
you know, it would take them to uh, improve, you know, make improvements from their perspective. That might be what is the service taking them to implement that plan. So how long would it take them to, to, to hire a driver? So it, you know, it might be a little bit, depending on if it like, service improvements in the WRTD division versus the seats. This sizable, you probably can't hear. You know, by the time, you know, but that would not include if, if additional fleet, even if it were not electric, new time on it, uh, you know, could equipment be identified somewhere else in the state? You know, there's a lot of things that would go into it. But, you know, typically, I think we would talk at least a year, there also might be. Um, requirements as far as even we enhance service in certain areas. Be made where they're being made, so all those people would also get into it. But it's not something that we could decide today and implement tomorrow. Um, I, I think that we should hear with you. Yeah, just to follow up a little bit. Um, you say that. Uh, Study recommendations in, include important component of implementing short or even medium term uh, implementation of the bus transit uh, plan. Or is that part of the study that will recommend that, or it's kind of neutral? Uh, that part of the study is, you know, we, we have tried to while well, we can't identify all the specific time frames for. Anything. Um, we have um, recognized what could happen in the near term versus the longer term. Rail would be a much longer term proposition plus transit. Um, and um, what we what we did find from the study of the findings is that while we recognize that bus can be implemented with rail in the longer term, it can also be implemented as a standalone option. So not just for the a lot of the region's short-term and long-term transportation and travel needs. Um, so so the, the report does frame it as such. That being said, rail could still be a viable option in the longer mm -hmm. term. Um, we are seeing a stronger market for rail along the Northeast Corridor than the Thames River. The Thames River, maybe if things change in the future beyond what we are aware of in this study and what we've already factored into our analysis in the future, transit that you know could potentially be implemented could also help create more demand for market for rail along the Thames River corridor. That could happen in even the longer term. Um, but that, that, so that is sort of all how the, the report frames these options. <laughs> that answers my question. I appreciate the answer. Thank you, sir. I do, I do want to say, I think your question is very good. I think you hit on an important part of that. The data really does show that a lot of the origin and destination pairings within the study area are within the study area. So a lot of that can solve with uh, transit, bus transit uh, solutions, not necessarily uh, train along the existing right away on the shoreline. So uh, a lot of the mobility needs and accessibility needs can be solved. Um, all new infrastructure and upgrades with transit buses. I think that's an important takeaway from the uh, from the site. Uh, right now, uh, see is looking at some uh, route changes, like a point to point. Now, uh, to kind of capture that commuter market or potential like affordability, well. Uh, know which housing is more affordable than the coastline. So there is demand. We have a lot of uh, rentals being built, and a lot of those are for potential EV. Something ahead of the state as far as that, but a point to point is different for us. We don't. We usually don't do a, a point to point. We may be starting that earlier. That's great. Questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. Welcome to Sandal and Ruth Lance, Manager of the Town of Ra. And thank you very much for the presentation. Just hoping you could speak um, sort of a high.
high level overview of the findings for the broad secondary. Um, so the Latin secondary was the, the limitations of the things or a bridge and how long that it can be down for with the Coast Guard, um, as well as Amtrak's current operations and future operations. They do uh, own the corridor, so we are in our territory and would have to be working with them. Um, so considering those factors combined, what we found is uh, that any new service brought to this area would only be allowed to cross that bridge once per hour in each direction. Um, so that means that we could have either continued further analysis with either the east side of the Thames River, the continuation along the Northeast Corridor, or the Broughton Secondary. And we chose to continue as the most viable um, and also meeting the most uh, uh, travel um, along the Northeast Corridor. Um, however, we do recognize that there are a number of institutions, there are a number of uh, major employers okay. in the region that are not secondary. Proposed in the package of transit strategies a new uh, demand response zone covering that entire area um, that would be able to uh, meet of commuters and a much more flexible um, uh, operation than even fixed route service um, and would connect them to the rail such as the proposed Rotten West station. Good morning. Thank you so much for the presentation. I'm Susan Cullen. I'm the Director of Economic and Community Development for the Town of Stonington. And I bring to you today some remarks um, from the first selectman, Danielle Chibro, who had a, a conflict with the meeting today. So she asked me to let you know that you know she really appreciates that the study demonstrating the expansion of passenger rail and bus service has been feasible, and that there is a market to provide those alternative transportations in Stonington and southeastern Connecticut. And she thanks you for your hard work on that. Um, she said it was good to see that the study recommend early expansion of Shoreline East to Westerly um, with the expanded and supporting bus service to serve the area's major employers, disadvantaged populations, as well as the general traveling public. Um, that the town of Stonington is pleased to see that the Connecticut DOT recommends a new train station be constructed in Stonington via the viaduct. And she'd like to remind you that the viaduct also has a construction project and that that would obviously need to be coordinated um, together um, as a single project. Um, that the town is delighted to see that the Stonington Rail Station would support both the town and the borough's efforts in transit-oriented development and mixed-use zoning in our downtown. Um, that area also, as an aside, is about to be um, established as a cultural district um, with the state of Connecticut. So there could be some, some other bonuses and advantages in terms of economic development, as my, the borough board had already stated. Um, given the questions of both rail and transit service along the Thames River corridor, expansion of transit service on both sides of the river would be a great first step to all the southeastern Connecticut communities. And that the town is pleased to see the desire to have commuter rail and transit services be more frequent, reliable, and to serve our destinations of interest. Uh, she had just a couple of concerns, um, and, and one actually mimics what Megan just said um, about that Broughton Secondary loop being quite important in terms of tying together those last mile problems, which you just um, you know, touched on a little bit. So it sounds like there are several different uh, solutions to that in terms of flexible service that might you know, address those, those things. She uh, also had said that should, there were some concerns with the existing Mystic Station, um, that pushing that station further east might make walking to downtown less feasible. 
and that the floodplain and wild conditions in that area might make it so that opportunities for more dense development um, for an expanded station um, could be more difficult and challenging. So uh, she also wanted to just um, make it clear uh, to our to our public that um, that there was no plan to be taking down buildings or removing people out of their houses. Um, we've had some questions locally about that, so we just wanted to get that on the record that there was no intention to use it. Thank you. Thank Sir, you. I believe you were next. <laughs> yeah, my name is uh, William Eleanor. I'm a, a resident of Marcusville, and I live fairly close to the present uh, west side line. Um, I know right now that uh, I think it's G and W. They operate on that. I don't. Do they own uh, the line? Yes. So you have to buy them out. No. Or are you going to use use them in conjunction with the present uh, G and W? We, if we were to pursue uh, passenger rail along their line, I believe we would have to go through an agreements process for access and um, operational rights along their right-of-way. Mm -hmm. okay. um, <clears throat> presently, uh, being women, I, I live by the uh, Fort Chantock area, so I'm quite familiar with the trains. Um, I guess they operate, <clears throat> I'd say maybe once a week, I see a line come up through a, a train. Um, they probably only travel about 25 miles an hour. And uh, the tracks, um, all the ties and tracks, um, they would have to be completely replaced. Um, right now, uh, in order to get any kind of speed. The other um, comment I was going to make is: <clears throat> Do you plan on using the diesels, uh, the GP40 diesels, or, or are you planning to use the M8 um, electric? electrics, electrifier? Uh, currently, that line is not electrified. Right. Um, so this this study does not consider um, or propose electrification in immediate operations. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, there is a statewide goal to electrify all rail lines into the future. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a timeline on any of that, but um, that would be the ultimate goal, but in, in the immediate future, that line is not electrified while the Northeast Corridor is. Yeah. And you're absolutely correct. There would need to be substantial upgrades to the infrastructure mm -hmm. in that corridor for passenger service to operate. Um, a lot of our clients rely on buses. They don't have to buy. They can't afford to buy. They can't afford to buy. They can't afford to buy. Bus transportation is extremely important for um, And when I hope you are really considering all of this, that as you know, the road, thinking of what the cost is for our clients to come in, that it's Thank you for your comment. You. Anybody else? The sir in the back?
across five years. Uh, I'm 72. And my question is, um, is there anything you can do to speed this thing along? Um, <laughs> so, as mentioned, we don't have any funding right now for any next steps beyond this study. Um, so, if you are interested in advocating for this, um, I recommend going through your uh, your local legislators and voicing, you know, your support. Um, you know, if we were to move anything forward, that's the first step. Is, is we would need to have funding identified. And I would just say, you know, that that's an illustrative sort of example of what the timeline was on a different service line and and no two corridors are the same so that's not necessarily the timeline that it would take for any other service expansion in the state um, it could go faster it could go slower uh, that particular uh, representation you know it started there were some uh, pauses along the way um, but it's just it's an example of, of how long it could potentially take and keep in mind that you know this study did look at you know a rail option and multiple rail options as well as you know uh, shorter term um, strategies that include bus you know those could be as we just heard you know implemented much faster than 25 years once funding is identified so you know for uh, for sort of the, the most complex strategy yeah you know there's an example of a 25 year horizon that doesn't necessarily mean that that's that it'll take 25 years but it's a good comment, and, and we did hear similar comments last night. Yes, ma'am. At this point, um, and I'm a bus rider. Does anyone in this room take the bus? Question uh, question about the uh, broad secondary. Uh, was it ever considered to do a sort of inky style service in, in terms of the Broughton Center and secondary, running from Broughton West down through the London Orange Airport up to Broughton City and uh, and uh, EB, uh, similar to the Princeton Yankee, which runs from Princeton Junction to Princeton in New Jersey? And just wondering if that kind of service was ever suggested or thought of instead of just running from New London across the bridge, as that would remove the uh, hourly constraint from the service, allowing you to do a direct cross-platform transfer at Broad and West. It's, it's perfectly timed to make sure that 
uh, you have direct service, still have direct service, while not impacting frequency of service to the east of London. Anyone? Oh, sorry, Jill. <laughs> uh, so the, the short answer is yes. We did look at innovative strategies on all of the lines, uh, including uh, the, the smaller the smaller train sets and the other options and the other uh, solutions. Um, uh, we did consider all of those as we were looking at the different strategies. Uh, in the end, what we, we, we need a you know a package of services that's that's implementable um, and uh, along a service strategy that could be potentially implemented, which includes not introducing new modes. Um, so uh, we we did look at it, yes, in general, and also look in particular in that region that there's a lot of needs in that re in the region along the Groton Secondary and did discover that the most direct solutions are rubber tired or ground transportation solutions in that region. And just finally, I just wanted to say that, uh, as you stated, the final solution you came up with was a direct, was direct continuing trolling these trains up to Westerly, and then with some trains going up to Norwich. Uh, now for, say, Waterbury, Danbury, or New Canaan, that makes sense, because the vast majority of traffic is heading down the shoreline to New Haven and Bridgeport and whatnot. However, if you look at a uh, uh, at the ridership numbers on the, uh, the on the on the draft final report on April 12 of the uh, draft final report it says that if, uh, within new ridership the SLE extension to Westerly would bring a new ridership of 159,300 with a uh, with the short with a uh, SLE extension to Norwich actually having more service 162,000. I'm going to suggest that you talk with Jill. Uh, when we break up because that's very specific and detailed and so she can talk to you about it one-on-one -on -one, if that's acceptable to you okay. thank you um anybody else one last call yes sir yeah. i would just like to addition to your legislators you also Right. Thank you. Okay, I think so. We're ready. Okay. Um, um, I'm what's called the, the, the project champion, uh, which means uh, I'm called the project champion. And that was the name given to me by the folks in the front of the room here. I suspect Mr. Elder had something to do with that. Um, and what that means is that um, I've been involved now for six years in trying to get uh, train and transit services uh, more uh, effectively established in uh, eastern Connecticut, particularly in southeastern Connecticut. It's all started in a very parochial sort of sense from my point of view because I was interested in the, the whole issue of the redevelopment of downtown Groton. And how do you go about doing that? Um, the Planning and Zoning uh, Commission changed the whole section um, along Route 1 to mixed use development. And as we looked at it, it was clear that the railroad road was running through that very area, and that uh, if you took that and you expanded it uh, and included the railroad uh, as a stop, then you had potentially what we refer to as transit oriented development. In other words, you could live shop and then go play, work, or visit uh, without ever having getting ever having gotten into a car. Now, for one reason or another, this thing has expanded to um, <laughs> to Westerly, um, all the way to Norwich and beyond. And uh, I've been very much involved with the legislation that was developed and I can go through a whole long, I don't think it's appropriate to, at this point, go through how that all happened. But it did happen. Uh, $2.3 million was appropriated for a two year period for directing the state of Connecticut to under uh, a DOT and the state of Connecticut to undertake um, this study. And the reason for this study is that it's important that you have to have a feasibility study effectively if you're going to go forward with any kind of federal, federal funding um, for these kinds of projects, that is transportation, infrastructure projects. And at the same time this is all happening, and you all know last year, the U.S. Congress passed an enormous 
an enormous amount of money for improving infrastructure across the nation. And so this comes at a very appropriate time uh, that we have this feasibility study underway. So I'd, I'd like to, and I said this last night, and they're going to fall asleep up front, but um, let me say it again. Um, we think the feasibility study that has been produced clearly demonstrates that it's feasible to improve and expand transportation, both rail and transit, that is buses, in this region. No question about it. And the first order of business would be to expand as much as possible and as early as possible the bus side of the equation. And then fill in the train part of this thing going forward. Now the train part of this thing is, I think, particularly difficult and important, important for the following reasons. This is really about two items. It's about economic development for our region of the world. It's simple. You don't have good transportation that gets people to and from where they work and live and play, then we lose. And I say this because if we don't get this money, someone else will, and they'll be more competitive than we will be. That's the first thing. The second thing is that this is a wonderful opportunity to make a dent, a little dent, in climate change. If we can get people out of their cars and their trucks, which is the only other way you can travel here um, effectively from where you live to where you work, um, we make a huge dent in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. In Connecticut, right now, this department right here has the unfortunate uh, distinction of having 40% of greenhouse gas emissions emitted from Light from cars and light trucks. And that is well above the national average, which is around 30 to 33 percent. What's particularly attractive about the rail and the bus is that the rails are in the ground. Now, it's not perfect, but they're in the ground, and some of them are in the floodplain, and we realize that. This proposal, this feasibility study, will be effective between now and probably 2050. Now, the reason I say that is because we already know, we already know, it's been well established, that if we don't do anything about reducing greenhouse gases worldwide, not even just here, worldwide, we're going to have about 20 inches of sea level rise in this area. And this area includes the shoreline of Connecticut and up the face of River to the city. So 20 inches of sea level rise up here means that if you're in the floodplain now, in the 100 year floodplain now, you add 20 inches to that elevation, you're going to flood much further inland than you would have before. So let me say, and I went through some detail last night with everybody about um, uh, where the floodplain is and why this is important. But I, I wanted to make a comment about um, uh, the three, the things that are required. Um, what I would hope the study does not do is to close off looking at options on both sides of the river. Because um, we have tracks that go up on the east side, tracks that go up on the west side. And I think it was pointed out, and the report probably needs to correct this, there's only probably one or two trains a week on the west side. Where on the east side, it looks like there's probably two trains a day, daily, back and forth on the, on the east side, uh, which means that those rails are probably in slightly better condition than are on the west side. Now, that's a, a really a very qualitative analysis on my part, because I'm no longer allowed to walk the rails, as these folks well know. Um, but I have driven uh, virtually to every place where I can see them from the road. Now, what the study has right now, it proposes for three stations along the west side of the river. And here's the problem. Each of these stations, they say in the report, is about $20 million to create. You're going to create $20 million stations on three locations on the west side. 
do we really want to spend that kind of money to put a station in a floodplain that we know is going to get worse in the next 25 years? And I would argue that we might, would really want to seriously consider that before we actually make that recommendation and report like this. And so I would be inclined to leave out of that study. You put the locations in, but not make the recommendation that the, that the implement. I mean, in downtown, right where we are right here, we have this train station literally right behind us. It's existing. You go across the river, there is no train station. And in fact, you have a essentially a steep slope. You do have a parking garage over there where buses go. It's a transportation center. But as has been pointed out, in order to get from the, where the trains are, where the where tracks are, across the river, you're going to have to build another bridge. Does that make sense in this day and age where we've got 20 inches of sea level rise, which we're facing, to create a station on the other side of the town when you already got one over here? Now, it's not used to the train station right now. It's used to house a uh, commercial operation. But it seems to me that one would, want to look, one would want to look at that very carefully. And if you go down to the casino in, in Montville and look at the situation, You've got a very steep slope again, and you've got at the bottom in the floodplain where the proposed station is. Would that make sense? And what is the economic or the, the, the development possibilities in a reservation which is set up basically for gambling and for entertainment? Housing on the reservation? I doubt it. It'll be interesting to see whether that actually goes forward. Now moving down to the Coast Guard station or the Coast Guard Academy in Connecticut College. Now, I know a little bit about that because I spent a couple of years uh, at Connecticut College. Um, I look at that, that location and I'm thinking um, that is really within almost a mile of the current existing station. Why would you create a new station that close to the existing station in downtown New London? When you have a population of people at Connecticut College and at Coast Guard Academy that do not leave the institutions, you rarely see a Coast Guard Academy cadet wandering around the streets of New London or anywhere in Southeast Connecticut. They go there to become officers and they stay there. Connecticut College is not a commuter commuter institution. You go, it's an, it's a it is a residential institution. The only people who choose to attend college are basically the faculty. And it's the population, um, uh, you, you, you would wonder, are they going to be using uh, rail to go up now at the elevation between the, where the rail station would be and the top of Route 32 is 190 feet. Well, that sounds more to me like a Department of Transportation construction project for a highway, not for a rail station. So when I look at the price of the capital expenses of some $600 million, um, I'm a little skeptical at this point. But I would prefer not to have that information basically forwarded because it basically, uh, what you see in the newspaper now is when you have a report about the study at this point, it says, oh, it's feasible. But oh, by the way, the whole thing's going to cost you a billion dollars. And I have a problem with it because I'm not sure that's really what um, is intended here. If the intent is to prevent it from going forward, you put a price tag high enough and it won't go forward. So I would hope that the study would be characterized with having this, having looked at this, there's feasibility for both bus and for expanded rail in the region. And that you be very careful about the location of the stations uh, up and down, particularly the Thames River, until we have further information along the line. Um, so those are the sort of the general comments I have about this. Um, I know um, uh, I am viewed as something of a thorn in the side of, of this process, um, but I am retired and they don't pay me, and I have no particular conflict of interest. I just have time in my hands. 
that I will pursue and continue to pursue uh, this in whatever direction it needs to go. And this will go to the legislature this coming uh, January. I'm sure the legislature will hold public hearings. And I would all invite you to uh, be involved with that process going forward. Because it's going to be really critical. I mean, the two ladies that are sitting right here in front of me suggest that, you know, their clients, their people, are having a hard time just getting on a bus. And what we know is that people can't get on a bus, on a basic bus. We've got problems. So this is all about economic development in the long term, and at the same time, and now what's so nice about this, and we should read what we call sustainable development, if you basically promoting development, at the same time, you're taking care of the environment. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, I hope uh, this helps in the, in the, in the evaluation. Um, as they know, I've already offered and we'll work with, with them to see that this uh, comes about. Um, I, one comment I have, and as I've repeated this, um, the jargon needs to be taken out of the report. Um, for example, when you say we're going to turn around a train, we don't turn trains around today. Those days are long gone. We don't have turntables. They come, they stop, and they then reverse and go in the other direction. Maybe on a siding so someone else can go by, so it's really creating a site. So it's that kind of language that is going to be very important. The average person, when you say transit, they go, huh? So what it means is reported buses. But then it's not, it's not just buses, it's micro transit. So how is that different from demand transit? And those need to be very carefully laid out so that the public does know what it is that's being proposed. Um, and I'd invite you all to look at carefully at the report. It's 71 pages. Um, it, it, is a, it is a daunting challenge to look at that. And if you need a little help sleeping, pick up the appendix, because it's only 800 pages. And it's really important to look and see how this whole thing is integrated. So I hope um, I've tried to spin this, if you will, in a positive way for the state and for the public. And I'm going to continue to do that. And I appreciate patience and willingness for the state to listen to all this. They've heard it before, and they'll probably hear it again from me. But I appreciate uh, being involved with uh, on the steering committee of this group. Thank you. Thank you, Zell. Are there any other questions before we wrap up? I would like to remind everyone that there is another virtual public session this evening. I believe it starts at 6 p.m. and uh, we are accepting comments through October 20th. October 20th. So if there's anything you want to say or if there's people that couldn't attend tonight that you know have comments, please uh, send them to the email address that's on the website as well as in the presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Awesome. Nice questions. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Because I was looking at Dave, Dave, and you.